morning. Um, welcome to Journeys. My name is Denise Hurley, and this is a Zoom special edition. And I am here with Meg Kilcoin. Um, Meg is running for state representative for the 12th district. Um, Carol Naughton is presently the state representative for the district, um, but he is stepping down. Meg is one of the, actually there's four women running for the open seat, that three Democratic and one Republican. So welcome, Meg. Thanks, Denise. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Hey, um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself before we explore the reasons why you were running? Yeah, sure. Uh, so as Denise said, my name is Meg Kilcoin, uh, and I'm running for state representative, and I am a Democrat. Um, I have deep ties to these communities. Uh, I grew up in Sterling and, and my family goes back, uh, you know, deep roots in, in Clinton. And so these were always, this is an area, these are communities that are really dear to my heart. And uh, the last 10 years, I worked as the current state representative, uh, Harold Naughton's legislative director. And in that capacity, I got to really serve these communities in these towns and be a part of both supporting them on their local issues and also working on, on statewide policies that would hopefully benefit not just residents of our communities, but everywhere. So one of the great things about um, that experience is it really gave me a sense of, of public service and what you could do at the state level to really help build up these communities. So when State Representative Naughton decided not to run, I really wanted to take the opportunity to run myself to, to both continue serving the towns and to hopefully bring my own vision to it. Um, and I think my experience would, uh, is, go, is, is, is an, a very important element of, of why I thought, let me back up a little bit. We are in unprecedented times and I decided to run in the middle of a pandemic, but I believe that my experience is, is essential to making sure that whoever is elected is going to have to deal with some very big problems and, and, and help get our communities and the state on a path to recovery. Um, you know, I, I know I've worked uh, for 10 years in the legislature. I've been a part of several bills that have been signed into laws. So I feel that I would be able to hit the ground running and to really be able to, to move our communities forward and hopefully start building on a better future. And so really simply, I felt I could do good. I've, I wanted to continue to do to help our communities and our residents. And that's in short why I'm running. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So our, um, our world just changed dramatically. Oh yes. Last couple of weeks. Um, we are now focused on dealing with racism uh, head on. And um, actually police reform is what we're looking at as mm -hmm. well. Uh, could you uh, speak to these issues and how would you try to make a difference? How would you help make that change happen? Absolutely. Um, I think something that we all have to start looking at, um, no matter what level of government you're in or what, no matter what your involvement in politics is. Um, I know it's something that I think many people are thinking about now, maybe trying to look within themselves and, and see what role they can play in trying to kind of combat racism. But um, you know, there is an important role we're going to see at the state level um, that's going to impact, I think, that we can, that we're going to see kind of immediately. Right now, we are seeing um, on Beacon Hill that they're discussing some reforms that might take place uh, or might be signed into law in the next couple of weeks. Obviously, that's something that may happen before, uh, you know, this election, but I think it's still worth talking about. Um, we have seen the House make a concerted or make a commitment to passing legislations to ban chokeholds, to increase diversity in the force, and to try to create more accountability when it comes to uh, police training and standards. Um, those are great start. A prop, that, that would be a great start. It's clear we need to do something immediately because I think nationwide we're seeing a lot of concern over what uh, the effects systemic racism may have on our police force. Um, but that's not where the conversation will end. So we mm -hmm. really need to make sure that when we're talking about police reform, we're continuing to look at ways that we may need to, to make changes. Um, creating a, a, a organization that's looking at training standards, I think, is a great start uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that all departments are, are participating in training that's going to help them on the job. Um, 
as part of my work for the legislature, I was the legislative director for public safety. So mm-hmm. even before this happened, this was a, a long conversation. Um, you know, there's, there was over the years, you've seen a lot of bills put forward that, that are looking at kind of targeted training for officers, especially for ex- instance, if they're responding to a call with somebody who, who has mental health issues, mm-hmm. how are they gonna be able to deescalate that situation? Um, and so this has always been something that we've always looked at. What train, what are we, what are the roles of our police officers in our community and what training do they need? And so I think we need to start look, taking that conversation more seriously on what as a broad, on a broad level, what training uh, standards do we have and are they adequate? And maybe even talking about, you know, what roles are we asking our police officers to do here? Um, so I think that it's, it's, you know, we're going to see uh, a concerted effort. I think a lot of more people are caring about these issues. They're telling their local officials, what are you doing about it? Um, I think for us locally, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, we have a very different police force than Boston or New York or some of these big cities. What are the implications of these reforms that are going to have in our smaller community departments and, and what support or resources do they need to be able to implement that? Um, uh, you know, some other examples of policy conversations that I think are going to be had. Uh, there's been talk, you know, there's some municipalities in the state that have, for instance, the, uh, the use body cams. Mm-hmm. Um, that's been a national conversation. So questions of how do you implement that on a state level? Um, you know, who is, when do the officers wear them? Do we do this statewide? Um, I think that's going to be a bigger conversation that we're going to have to have. There are several municipalities uh, throughout Massachusetts that are already doing this. So it's, we're seeing that it is possible. Um, creating more accountability if there is a shooting that occurs, you know, looking at why that occurred. And, and um, I know there's, there's been bills that are looking at, you know, creating a review board. So there's, there's an outside uh, body that kind of looks at these and, and what went into it. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities here. I would, if elected, it's something that I definitely want to, would want to use my experience having kind of dealt with some of these issues and, and looking to see what other reforms are we looking at? What do we need to do? Uh, and what are we doing to really make sure that we are addressing this issue of racism? Uh, and, and I think it's important to note too, it's, it's an issue beyond just our policing. You know, this is a broader conversation that right. we're going to have to have, but right. I think, this is kind of where we're starting this conversation now. And, and hopefully we're going to look at other areas in our, in our system, in our culture or society that, you know, how do we address racism at all forms? Like how do we really start tackling this, this centuries long problem? Exactly. So, so there's a lot of work to be done. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> definitely a lot of work to be done. And that would be something that you probably we have to tackle um, now. Exactly. Right I mean, now, yeah. what's going on? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay, now, you're going to be representing six different towns, uh, state, and obviously different towns have different needs. Um, and how do you address those needs of each town? Um, and how... Are you going to hold office hours? I mean, obviously now it's a little different, but, you know, town halls. Um, and how do you, will you take input from, you know, town administrations as well as townspeople regarding issues? I think that's an important thing to, you know, listen to. Yeah. Obviously you have to work with the town administrations to get things done, but also the townspeople should have some kind of input. How do you deal with that? Oh, absolutely. And I think that's a great question. And I really love that you pointed out we have six different towns. There's other representatives that, you know, represent one part of a city, Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, makes it a lot easier for them to sometimes be maybe in tune to, you know, what is going on at the ground level. But for us here in in Lancaster, Clinton, Sterling, all these six towns, you're Mm -hmm. dealing with six different governments, um, six different uh, town administrators. It is so important to be accessible. So to your point about office hours, I mean, obviously, we're going to have to see what what that will look like, given public safety guidelines. Um, Traditionally, 
you know, I would love to use local libraries or town halls, any public space that people would feel comfortable to come in. Like oftentimes you'll see maybe like a morning or an afternoon at different various locations. So people feel comfortable, you know, even if they're just kind of walking by and they're like, oh, there's office hours today. I think I want to go talk about this bill or this problem I'm having. And just being able to walk in and talk to your, to your state rep and being able to feel like they know you and they care about you and they want to, because that's why we're here ultimately. We want to know what our constituents care about and what we need to do to best represent them. Um, but to your point also, you know, you also want to make sure that you are, have an open line of communication with all of these different select boards and town administrators and town government. Um, you know, as a, if, if elected, I would want to make sure that my town administrators, my select board members had my, you know, had my cell phone, could call me at mm -hmm. any time to let me know what was going on, to let me know what problems they had or what funding needs they, they would have. Um, communication is so essential, I think, for any elected official. And, you know, in my own experience, you need to be able to let your, the town member, the town governments know what is happening on the state level, because oftentimes they rely on what we're doing with the state budget that's going to inform what they do on a local budget. So for instance, um, you know, chapter 70 funding, sometimes at the state level, you'll know in April what those numbers are going to be when they pass it in July. So being able to call up all of your town administrators and say, hey, you're gonna get X amount of dollars for chapter 70 funding. That is guaranteed, even though we haven't passed the budget, that's gonna help them be able to figure out, okay, like how are we gonna be able to structure our town budgets? Um, same with, uh, it's called cha chapter 90 funding, which is funding that is uh, state funding that is given to the towns to uh, uh, make improvements to roads. You need to be able to communicate to your town administrators ASAP this is what we got for funding for this town. You need to know that right away. And that's gonna help them be able to know how they can allocate their local funds. Um, you, you know, it, it's so important that you are working collaboratively so you can best uh, serve these communities because there is a lot of interaction between what we're doing at the state and how that informs local resources. And that's gonna be so important now with with COVID-19, we're having sort of an irregular budget cycle um, and we don't know how long it's going to continue. So being able to, be, uh, you know, tell the boards of selectmen and the town administrators, you know, even if you don't know, that's an important thing to communicate. Like we, we're in a situation where we don't know what the budget's going to look like. And we have to make sure that our communities know that because they can't rely, they need to know what is going to uh, be coming in to structure whatever our local budgets are or how we're going to address some of these uh, revenue dis, uh, disparities in the next few months. And it's going to take a lot of communication and collaboration, but communication at the bottom line is, is so important. It's something that I would want to really um, emphasize as a, 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 as a state representative if elected. And obviously with COVID-19, um, the lo our local businesses and workers are being impacted um, with the lockdown and with the reopening now too. That's a whole mm -hmm. new dynamic that we're, we're uh, kind of going through. Um, how do you support that? Uh, what would you do? Um, it's, it's vital that we get our businesses back Absolutely. opened up and safely. So what would you do? It's, it's a very good question. Um, and you know, I don't have all the answers right now. Um, we're still learning as we go how this is going to look. We are getting new information every day. And kind of to go back to our earlier conversation about communicating all of these things, you know, we mm -hmm. are just getting information on, um, I think it's, I forget what they called it. It's like safe spaces or safe public spaces. But just this week, we're seeing restaurants are finally able to have outdoor seating. Mm -hmm. And municipalities were able to work to quickly, um, you know, allow some of these restaurants to expand out into the road or to kind of expand beyond what would cons be considered their property to accommodate more outdoor spaces so we can get more people enjoying those restaurants. Um, going forward, as these the phases continue, it's going to be able to kind of disseminate what the information that's coming from public health officials, see, working with our local officials, 
seeing what questions there are, trying to get information back and, and working to address, you know, some of these are going to come down and it's just, it's not going to work or there's going to be confusion as to how to implement that. So being able to, as a state rep, being that go between, between the executive office and local governments, pointing out to those that are making these decisions, like, Hey, this isn't feasible for Clinton or Sterling or Lancaster. Um, we need to be able to, to, to be able to quickly address those concerns and work to maybe make changes if necessary. Um, you know, going forward, I think we've seen uh, at a legislative standpoint, we've had to be able to quickly make laws that are going to allow our local governments to have more flexibility to both um, uh, conduct business in a way that's safe, but also kind of allow some of these businesses to reopen. Um, there's a lot of challenges involved, um, but I think, you know, as a state rep, you have to be able to be there, you know, if there's a law that needs to be changed, file legislation or signal to the governor, like this needs to happen now. Mm -hmm. um, working to, to communicate back to small businesses and local governments, like this is what the resources that are available to you now. As sometimes there's confusion or it's hard for some of these businesses to know what is, um, what is even out there. For instance, I think in phase two, you know, one of the guidelines was like, you need signs posted about washing your hands or using sanitizer for a restaurant. And I talked to one um, restaurant owner about, you know, how do I get these signs? I, I there was miscommunication, uh, confusion over whether or not, you know, do you need to have professional signage made? Do you have to get it from the government? And I was able to direct uh, this, this restaurant owner to, uh, you know, the, the website that had sort of these mock-up PDF signs that you could just print out and that would that would be sufficient and it and you know they were able to eliminate them and get them up there and comply with some of the new guidelines but um you know at the base level at the most immediate level making sure that you're working to communicate this and then talking with local businesses about like what do we need to do to make this better because they're the ones on the ground they're going to be the ones that know what support is needed so when you're trying to figure this all out um, and get it to the business owners, what what they have to do? Who do you who do you communicate with? Is it the town administrators? Do you get to sit down with them and say, okay, right now this is how we're going to do this, and then they can pass the information? How does that get communicated to the community? I mean, it's I would say it's a situation where you want to try to blast out to as, met, uh, as much information as you can. I mean, people are getting inundated with communications right now, which can make it a bit difficult, but yeah, you'd wanna tell your, your, your town administrators, you'd wanna mm -hmm. be on the, like be available to answer any questions if, if business restaurant or restaurant owners are reaching out directly to you, you know, maybe proactively reaching out if you can. You can't always reach maybe every single restaurant in the district, but I think there's enough that it's, we're getting so much information blasted out to us that I think for a state rep, there's different means that you can communicate that. You can update your social media feed. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you'll see a lot of, you know, um, email blasts go out. So people that are sort of subs subscribing to that, um, being able to direct them where this information is publicly posted um, and making sure that those that are in a position to um, put this out on the local level are also in, aware of it as well. Okay. All right. Um, so the, the next challenge that we have then, um, is educating our children um, these days. And, um, you know, I, parents, I, I give you kudos for being home and homeschooling your kids, you know. And so what's your vision of uh, our new educational system that's going to be brought forward? Um, you know, how will you work with various, uh, I guess, school administrations and um, to help them out, to help them navigate all this? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, you know, I think the first priority I would have is, is we are looking at uh, some serious budget questions with COVID-19 and its impact on the economy. Um, and so I think that my first priority would be making sure that our school districts are not facing the brunt of some of those impacts of um, revenue shortfalls. 
in, October, in the fall of 2019, the legislature passed um, a, uh, it's called the Student Opportunity Act that would have brought $2 billion more in funding to our local schools. So all of our schools in our six towns were slated to see an increase in school funding. I don't know what that will look like with some of these, uh, with the impact of COVID-19, but I think that we need to do everything we can to restore those, that funding to the levels that we had committed to as quickly as possible. I think a lot of districts are struggling right now with questions over what funding they're going to have. Um, we've seen in some other school districts, I think Brookline a few weeks ago, that there's cuts that are being made, um, which is incredibly concerning given some of the um, guidelines we've seen from the Department of Education that came out, I think earlier this week, um, regarding you know limits to classroom sizes and, and masks. I, we need to, it's very concerning to me that we are having to, to make our schools adapt to these changes with so many questions about what resources they're going to have to do that. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of parents are concerned, especially of young children, about the idea of, of trying to keep socially distant. I mean, if you're seven or eight years old, it's a lot harder to maybe say you have to keep six feet back from your friends on the schoolyard or in the classroom. Um, you know, I think we're still grappling with what's that, what, what that's going to look like. But, um, you know, I have family members that are in the public school system. I have, my sister is a, a public education teacher and I've seen firsthand what she had to do to adapt to this, you know, revolutionary change in some ways to how our education system was administered. Um, you know, going all remote in a matter of days and weeks is, is, is incredible. And, and our, I give our, you know, our education, our teachers, our parents and our kids so much credit for adapting in these unprecedented times. But, you know, we have to really seriously continue this conversation on, on what those guidelines, how it's going to actually work, if it's going to work. And the first thing I would want to do as a state rep is make sure that we were, if there are any funding cuts to education in the immediate future, get those levels back to where they need to be as quickly as possible. Um, because we're going to, we desperately need to make sure that our, our public education system is properly funded and they have the resources to actually educate our kids. Hmm. Um, moving on to um, gender equity. What, what, what does that mean to you? Uh, um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, I mean, basically it just means that, you know, we are doing everything we can to make sure that uh, men and women are, are equal in society. Um, I think that, you know, that we've made a lot of progress over the years, but I think there's a lot of disparities in, in you know, how, uh, in, in what our system looks like when you're a man or a woman. I mean, we see that there's a significant lack of women in leadership positions. Um, mm -hmm. I think a great thing about this race, as you pointed out earlier, there are so many women running. Um, our representation of women in government is significantly lower than that of men. Um, you know, we see that in, in, um, you know, in the private sector as well. A lot of board of directors don't have many women representation and even fewer CEOs. So, you know, making sure that we're breaking down barriers that are, um, you know, make preventing women from sort of reaching upper echelons. And some of that is involved in, in policy decisions too. I mean, like universal pre-K is a way that could alleviate some childcare needs, um, making sure that we do have, that parents do have access to affordable childcare um, is also really important. Um, and making sure that we're not, you know, that women don't have to make a choice between, you know, going to work or having to pay, too much money for childcare um, and that they have options available to them. I mean, it's not about, it's about making sure that men and women have the same choices and same de decisions to, to do, uh, to live their lives the way they want and that we're doing what we can to make sure we're breaking down social and cultural barriers and, and you know, in, institutional barriers to prevent that. Um. How do you feel about the recent changes on uh, regarding sexual assault on college campus, campuses? Is, that's referring to the Title IX changes from the federal government. Yes. I think it's incredibly disappointing. Um, I think 
you know, we know that statistics show sexual assault and rape are, are heavily underreported and even fewer of them are convicted. And we know that sexual assault happens on campus and it can be really difficult for victims to come forward. Um, I think it's unfortunate that some of the guidelines have made it more difficult and narrowed the definition of what sexual assault is. So I, I worry that the changes made may discourage many who were victims of assault from coming forward to accuse their, um, uh, to, to report their abusers um, and assaulters. And I do feel that we should roll back the, the regulations that are currently in place should be, you know, roll back to the Obama level where we were trying to encourage and create a safer environment where women could feel more comfortable um, and safer to, to say if they've been assaulted. Now, we at a state level can't necessarily force the gov federal government to make those changes. Although I do believe, I think um, Attorney General Maura Healey did file a lawsuit to, 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 uh, that, to end those changes, yes. There are um, some bills at the state level that I think um, have been discussed over the years that I would want to support. Um, there's one bill that would create a climate survey to um, college campuses looking at sexual assault. So we have more data and information on how, how much of a problem this is at the state level and start, start to take steps so colleges within the Commonwealth are not hindering women from, and men from coming forward if they've suffered from sexual assault. Um, and making sure that if we're, the federal government's not gonna do its job in protecting victims, that we in the Commonwealth are doing what we can to compensate for that. Um, now, I, I have heard that regarding domestic violence that um, because of the stay at home, uh, that it, it may have risen some um, so can yeah. you speak a little bit about domestic violence in, uh, in our state and how that's being addressed and particularly now with everything going yeah. on? It's, it's an incredibly, um, scary, I, I know this was something that occurred to a lot of people quickly when we went on lockdown that people that are in domestic, um, are abusive partnerships or victims of domestic assault, what is going to happen there? Um, I think, I know that there are people that are trying to look at that issue to address it head on. For instance, um, you know, a problem for, a problem that we saw where the courts were closed during the pandemic. So typical, you know, there's questions as to if you are in danger, how are you going to file a 209A order or a restraining order or, you know, a harassment order? So I know the trial court has made several steps to try to, facilitate an electronic filing of that, um, which is good. But I think we also have to make sure that those we're doing outreach and that even if it's, you know, just telehealth or, you know, we have, we get, we're able to reach women that need access to, to therapy or social services um, so they can have somebody to call and have resources available to them, um, making sure that is, you know, in more languages than just English, because there's, there's a lot mm -hmm. of women that may be in situations where they don't speak English, don't know what resources, resources are there. Um, you know, the biggest, I know that there's been work to try to communicate what to do if you're in a domestic violence situation with COVID-19 and where you can go and, and if you need to get out of the home um, and making sure that that's, uh, uh, that there are a, people that can make that difference are doing outreach, but it is certainly a worrying, a very worrying concept. And, you know, I've been monitoring what's being done. I'm mm -hmm. hoping we'll get a sense of, you know, I know that there's, there's people that are looking at it and people that are trying to address it, but we have to continue to make sure even as we reopen that what, what was, if, if levels rose, if we did enough, and then what were the, you know, what are the holes that we still need to fill to make sure that women and men that didn't have a place to go or didn't feel safe, what more could have been done in that time? Because, you know, it's going to continue to be a problem even without the pandemic. And this, hopefully we can, we, we can do better at making sure people feel they can, they can 
have a safe space to go so they're not trapped in a, in a abusive situation. Um, okay. Now you mentioned telehealth and that kind of brings me to our healthcare system in, in the state. Um, I, you know, I, I feel that we do have a strong healthcare system, um, but I'm wondering what more we, that you can do uh, to strengthen it, you know, for seniors, veterans and other yeah. folks. Um, I think that, um, you know, to start with telehealth, I guess, since I did already mention it, um, that I think is something that we could do at a state level pretty quickly to mm -hmm. improve access to care. Um, I think that, and I, I don't want to say this definitively, but my understanding is many, pro, many um, plans didn't always cover telehealth as a service. But once COVID-19, um, you know, hit, we suddenly, I think there was a quick realization that telehealth is the safest way to quickly administer health, especially if you thought early in the early on when the spread started happening, if you thought you had it, the ability to call a physician to get a quick, you know, assessment of your symptoms to know whether or not you had to worry or, or were eligible to take a test. Um, I think some of the first regulations we actually saw were making telehealth more accessible to more people to prevent though to prevent unnecessary trips to the hospital. Um, and I think that we need to continue to make telehealth more accessible even after we are out of this pandemic because it is an, such an easy way and such a, to, to get care quickly. Uh, if you don't have to go to the hospital and can stay in your home and talk to a physician and figure out if you, it, it could save you a trip. And, and um, you know, nobody wants to go to an emergency care unit if, if it turns out like, oh, actually that's just a bug bite. You don't need to worry about it. You know, you want to be able to, to have that assessment done quickly. Um, I'd also like to see in the state that we do have a more robust uh, investment in primary care. Um, you know, in other countries, uh, we've seen a lot of, a lot of other countries really focus more on the primary care than I think we do in, in the United States. And we've seen in those countries that if you have access to more regular chips to your primary care physician, um, you're going to be able to prevent health issues from becoming bigger, more expensive problems. Um, you know, we, we don't in the United States, um, and I don't know the specific numbers for the Commonwealth, but we don't have a lot of primary care physicians compared to more specialized care. Um, often, you know, some of that I think is due to compensations, but creating incentives to have more primary care doctors, making it easier for residents to kind of access a primary care physician and, and really focus on preventative health so people can get more regular care and not have to have a problem become an issue that might require more serious intervention. Um, so those are two things I'd really like to see in our healthcare system. As you said, I think we do a great job at, at coverage, but there are still gaps in our coverage system. So I'd really, you know, I think we really do need to look at ways to kind of close those loopholes and make sure that everybody has access to healthcare um, because it can be, uh, you know, we have to, we can't just, say, if, you know, even if it's 97%, th those 3% of folks mm -hmm. still need care. So those are sort of the basic things I'd like to look at as a state representative, you know, off the bat at our healthcare system. And I think it's something too, we'll, we're, we're clearly seeing that um, another thing that will need to be discussed in light of COVID, especially with rates of unemployment so high and so many more people on mass health what are ways that we can kind of reduce costs because it's going to continue to take up a huge chunk of our state budget every year. Mm -hmm. um, what are your ideas regarding uh, climate change? How would you address what's happening with that uh, topic? I think climate change is something that people are, are it's, an, it's an issue that we have to address now um, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that's going to continue to be a problem. And I think, you know, especially for people that are, you know, have young children or, you know, for everyone really, but those of us that may be, you know, 150 years from now feels like a long time, but we're still going to be here and we don't want to be in a situation where we've reached, we've reached a crisis where there's no turning back. Um, I think some of the things that I'd like to see um, or I'd like to support is uh, legislation and policies that are currently being discussed at the Hill to reduce um, our carbon emissions um, to, I think, zero by 2050. Um, there's, I think there, 
was a commitment made a couple of years ago to get it to like reducing it by 80 or 90 percent by 2050 but i think it's important that we kind of push that to um reducing it as much as we can and that goes you know that would include things creating incentives when you're building new infrastructure to incorporate green energy um you know, making sure we're improving the mass save program, which is mm-hmm. this government mm-hmm. program that will go in and, and kind of look at your home and, and tell you ways that you can reduce your carbon footprint. Um, making sure our public transportation system is is not is you know reducing their carbon emissions or creating net zero emissions, so they're not putting more of that into um, you know more carbon into the air. That would be a big one. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of talk to of we we don't invest, I think we only invest like 0.5% in our state budget in green energy and green infrastructure. So maybe upping that to 1% would be a good way to really jumpstart some of these efforts to um, make sure we're reducing our, our carbon footprint and, and investing in renewable energy. Um, and, you know, looking at it from a broader level as well. I mean, we see in throughout the state, a lot of lower income neighborhoods are, you know, not always have the same ability to, uh, you know, build a home that's going to be running off solar energy or solar panels. So ways that we can invest in, you know, if a lot of times the state will invest in, in, you know, a, a public housing or something and making sure that for building any housing or going in any neighborhood and making sure they have the access to the same ways to reduce their carbon footprint as, as any of anyone else would. Um, now I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about our cr- criminal justice system here in Massachusetts and how do we tackle and make some changes in the system? Um, Um, Just your thoughts on that? I think it's a great question. Um, We, in 2018, we, the legislature passed a criminal justice reform act, which took a lot of steps, necessary steps to address some of the issues in criminal justice, such as incarceration rates, um, making sure we're reducing those, uh, trying to reduce rates of recidivism. I mean, I think the biggest question we have in our current criminal justice justice system is making sure that we're not, um, you know, working to decriminalize certain things that are maybe not as, like, for example, decriminalizing marijuana, um, expunging past Mm -hmm. crimes if you've been convicted of a marijuana possession now that it's no longer illegal, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, making sure that we're uh, we're not... um, that we're, we're taking steps to reduce prison populations and that doesn't always lead to um, increased public safety. Um, in terms of what, you know, we want to do going forward, you know, I think we're still seeing some of the effects of that bill, but I think we still can do more work to uh, deal with, with crime rates, looking at our laws now. I mean, one of the things the 2018 bill did that was huge was uh, getting rid of a lot of mandatory minimums, but, you know, which, which makes mandatory minimums was a big reason why some incarceration rates are as high as they were, because it would eliminate the ability of a prosecutor to, uh, you know, reduce a sentence if they felt that it didn't rise to, you know, the level of the maximum amount. Um, So I think, you know, there's, we're seeing some of the impacts of that now, but we have to continue to look at the system as a whole, what loopholes were in that omnibus bill, and what changes are still necessary to make sure that um, our criminal justice system is truly reflective of justice and not used as a mechanism to, uh, to not, that's not improperly punishing or punitive, uh, punishing our citizens unnecessarily. Okay. Um, now our, our laws in Massachusetts regarding, uh, guns, uh, you know, See, we have strong laws in Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, but I'm just curious on how you feel about, you know, gun violence overall. I mean, um, interesting. I think right now it, it seems to have gone down a little bit in terms of the episodes of that happening because of COVID. But overall, could you just give me your thoughts about gun violence and how that's something that, that we can tackle. Yeah, I mean, 
This is actually something I've worked on a lot in my career in the legislature. Um, I, as working as a legislative director for the public safety committee, when those shootings happened over the last few years, it was usually something that we had to, I had to work directly on. So when Sandy Hook happened in 20, not 2013, no, I think it was 2012, actually, December of 2012, mm -hmm. the next two years were spent talk, having a major conversation about gun reform. Because up until that point, there hadn't been really a major law passed in Massachusetts since 1998. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I got to spend months talking to gun owners, talking to victims of gun violence, talking to people that were in places of, of high gun violence, um, and, and being a part of work crafting legislation that sought both to reduce gun violence in our state, and then there were also changes made to our licensing system. to Because, I mean, we actually did hear complaints from, you know, legal gun owners that kind of cited our current licensing system is pretty complicated. I mean, there were, at the time, there were two different licenses you could get um, to, to carry, uh, but one, they both were really confusing as to why you needed which. Most There was a Class A, Class B, most people had Class A, so we actually just ended up making it a straight license to carry to try to simplify it, uh, making it a bit more streamlined. Um, that law also included um, language to make sure that we were in line with federal guidelines um, and able to send records to the National Instant Background Check System, which is if you were to purchase a gun, your name gets entered and you immediately get checked through the national database. But uh, the, the state had not submitted any records to that because there were certain um, uh, state or certain uh, state laws that prevented us from legally sending those records over. So they fixed that. So we were able to send um, uh, records be a part of that instant background system. Um, we made changes to uh, strengthening, strengthening the licensing procedure for uh, federal identification cards, which is um, another way you can own a firearm. You just can't carry it on you. A lot of, it's, it's typically something that a lot of hunters, for instance, would get. Uh, but that was kind of my first, you know, that was in 2014. That was kind of my first uh, real work on, on gun laws. And then two years ago, after the Parkland shooting, um, mm -hmm. I helped craft legislation to create an extreme risk protective order. Those are commonly known as red flag laws, but basically it created a system by which if a family member or law enforcement officer felt that a gun, somebody that owned a gun were a danger to themselves or others, it would create a way to, to petition a judge to have that firearm removed from their possession for a year. Um, uh, and also, you know, make sure they protected their due process. So it would be adjudicated and, you know, you would go before a judge. And with that law, we actually already are seeing people and family members that were able to use it to, to you know, make sure a loved one and a family member was safe and not in danger of hurting themselves or others. Um, so that was another example of even as late as 2018, uh, an additional layer that we could place on our gun laws to try to make things safer. Um, to your point, our gun laws are very strong. We have some of the strongest gun laws in the nation. Um, and it's something that I've had the uh, privilege of being able to work on and be a part of, which has been, you know, very, you know, very exciting. Um, and has also given me a pretty deep understanding of, of what our current laws are now. Mm -hmm. In terms of what more needs to be done, you know, despite our strong gun laws, we do still see a lot of um, areas in the Commonwealth that are subjected to high rates of gun violence. Um, you know, part of that is, is a problem with our federal system because we do see a lot of legal guns that are coming from out of state, but trying to make sure that we're doing what we can to get crime guns off the streets. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know there's been um, bills and I can't remember if this was in the 2014 law, but ways in which we can study where these crime guns are coming from to have a better understanding of how they're getting on the streets. Um, another conversation that I've seen that a lot of people are concerned about is this whole concept of what's called ghost guns. So ghost guns are where you can, you know, um, if you have a 3D printer, for instance, you could manufacture certain parts of the firearm and, and put it together yourself or order different parts and kind of put it together, um, mm -hmm. which is a problem because it's not going to be registered under, you know, our state, um, um, registered with the state and not have a serial mm -hmm. number. So it's sort of seen as an unregulated gun. So, I mean, as technology like that improves, we have to make sure that our laws are keeping up with those advances and that we're able to 
have a way to know where these guns are and that people that are owning them are, are licensed and able to possess a firearm. Um, uh, so those are a couple th examples of both what I've done in the past and an example of what could be done in the future. There's also a lot of talk about, um, you know, there's been at the federal level uh, a reluctance to look at gun violence as a public health issue. Um, despite the fact our country has higher rates of gun violence than other nations in the world. So making, you know, improving research in that area, I think is also mm -hmm. something that we have to start looking at, even if it's only in a, at the state level. Um, now I know we touched on uh, a little bit, well, we touched on what's been going on currently, um, but I do wonder how you would address the needs that we have for um, LBG, LGBTQ uh, communities, um, because obviously there's a rise in hate crimes uh, towards that community as well as people of color. Uh, could you address the needs of those communities a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that even before COVID-19, our conversations about inequities in our society uh, LGBTQ people were a marginalized group and a very vulnerable group, I should say. Um, you know, there's higher rates of homeless, homelessness among um, LGBTQ youth. Um, and there is a bill that, you know, I would hope to support if elected that would um, seek to give support to homeless LGBTQ, LGBTQ youth um, to make <laughs> sure that, um, you know, a lot of times they're unaccompanied minors to make, and so making sure that we're, you know, putting systems in place that can try to uh, help, you know, some of these kids in, in some cases um, be, have a safe space to go and, and not be in a dangerous situation. Um, um, you know, there was, uh, when at my time in the legislature, there was a lot of work on, on um, creating a state ban on conversion therapy, which at mm -hmm. the time, you know, wasn't illegal. Um, it, and that is another example of, you know, they're in this state, children could still be sent to um, locations that would try to, you know, convert their sexuality, which broadly uh, research has, has broadly denounced as a harmful practice. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways that we can, you know, make sure we're doing what we can to recognize this is a vulnerable group of people and what are ways that we can both you know, protect not just the younger generations, but making sure there's steps for older generations as well, too, because we see statistics show that this is, there's still a marginalized, there's still a, a marginalized group of people that um, just experienced, uh, they're just more vulnerable um, and disproportionately affected by issues such as like violence and, and um, poverty and, and things like that. Thanks. Okay. So um, I have had a lot of um, input on, on folks talking to me about public transportation out in this, these neck of the woods type of thing. Yeah. Because it's hard uh, for people to get around and using any, you know, because we don't have that here per se. Yep. Any, really public transportation. And I know a lot of people are like, hey, I'm paying into the system, but I'm not reaping the benefits of it. So um, can you talk a little bit about that? Is it the state could, I mean, do you have any idea what can be done to, to help us with that? I mean, yeah. to me, that's important too. <laughs> oh, well, trust me, this is an issue that I have been personally impacted by because <laughs> You know, over the years, there's been many a time where I've had to rely on public transit to trans to, to commute from this area to Boston. Mm -hmm. So I typically would go down to, I mean, we have two commuter rails that we are kind of, we're right in between um, out here. So there's um, North, there's North Lemonster and the Worcester Station. Um, and that's great, but both of those take about my commute would be roughly two hours each way and back factoring in the time it took for me to, you know, drive to each station and park and wait for the train. And that's if everything was running smoothly. So there were times where my commute daily would be four hours a day. 
because of that was the only access that we had to public transit. Now I know Worcester is starting to do an express line that would be about, I think mm-hmm. it leaves around eight and it gets you into Worcester by nine, but that's the, I think there was only one that's available and the rest of the, if you get a regular train, it's going to still be about two hour plus to commute out there. And beyond that, there's no bus system or anything that would link, you know, the center of Lancaster or other towns to these commuter rail stations. So if you don't have, a, you still need a car to get there. Um, I would love to see a more um, robust effort to expand, even if it's just starting with like public buses to make sure people have access to some of the other transit systems in the state. I'd love to see an increase in express trains. Um, I'd like to see our trains be, you know, making sure they're not going to break down as much. I've actually been in a situation where one time I was stuck on a train for five hours because of the cold, which sometimes causes the MBTA MBTA, uh, engines to, I guess, freeze or something, they shut down. But, you know, that's not acceptable. And, you know, people that are rely, you need to make sure that our transit is reliable, that, you know, you can, you're going to get to where you need to be on time. And you're not going to spend four hours a day trying to get to work. And I think this is going to become an issue that we're not, that they're, we're going to have to invest more in, or the state is going to need to invest more resources in. Because mm-hmm. as you said, we are paying into the system. Um, and I think we're seeing now with COVID-19, a lot of people are maybe commuting habits are changing. And, you know, people are still going to get to Boston, but people might want to be able to kind of live out here and not have to go two hours, but if they want to maybe not rely on a car as much, especially if they're trying to reduce their carbon footprint, is right. there a way that we can get from, you know, the center of Lancaster to Worcester or the center of Lancaster from Lemonster? Like we still don't really have a great infrastructure of right. getting to and fro in our immediate area. Um, you know, the focus is on Boston because that tends to be where many people are commuting to. And I, I know prior to COVID, I think there was actually a push of people living out here that were commuting into the city Maybe that'll continue when things go back to normal. I don't know, but mm-hmm. it, it is it is difficult for folks to if if they want even if they wanted to to get around without having a vehicle. And I would really love to see a better uh, mechanism in place, more access to public transit. Um, I don't know if there's going to be any expansion of lines into our na- area. I know, like years and years ago, I think there was a commuter rail stop in in Clinton. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the short, the shortest one to Lancaster is Shirley, I think, I think that's off 117, but it's, it's, it's kind of still inadequate to what, you know, compared to what we see in other urban areas, we deserve to have more of an ability to be more mobile, um, through public transit, in my opinion. So I'd love to try to start looking at ways that we can work to better that here, um, and making sure that we're we're reallocating resources out into central mass and making sure that we have the ability to travel to. And it's, it's also a question goes back to climate change. You know, if we can make public transit more accessible, people won't need to get in their cars all the time. Right. Yeah. Oh, I would love that. I would love a bus and just get on and go where I wanted to go without have, depending on a car. <laughs> uh, Okay. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, address that we haven't touched on uh, today? Ooh, that's a good question. I do feel we've covered a lot of important topics. Um, I, you know, off the top of my head, I, I do think we, a lot of what we discussed are things that I would love to do if elected. Mm-hmm. Um, I do, you know, I do feel that there's a lot of problems and issues that we have to tackle um and Mm -hmm. i would i i really do believe or i would i would want to tell voters that i have the experience to hit the ground running and address Mm -hmm. these issues for me too one of the great great things about this period is hearing from voters of what issues they care about as well so you know i i would i love to hear from folks about what it is at a local level that they're looking to improve what it is we need to do better in each of our communities and how we can kind of build that up together. Um, So, you know, I I don't think, I think we covered a lot of big, broad policy topics. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so I don't really have too much to add to that, but I think this was a great way to kind of break them all down and discuss different ways that we can hopefully 
build a better commonwealth and, and you know, help all of our communities in this district. Great. Okay. And now um, people want to get in touch with you. Um, what's your uh, social media information, your email? How, how would someone reach out to you? Yeah, so I am on Facebook. Um, I have a page, state, Meg Kilcoin for State Representative. Uh, I also have a website. That's probably the best source of trying to get all this information because it also includes links to social media. So, um, and that is www.megkilcoin.com. Um, and my last name is spelled K-I-L-C-O-Y-N-E for those that don't know how to spell it. Um, that would probably be the best source of information. You'll be able to get in touch. You know, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and they'll have links to all of that. Um, and I do have an email, um, megkillcoinforrep at gmail.com if folks want to email me or have any questions about why I'm running or, or what they care about as well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, for, this was uh, wonderful. Doing this with me and uh, you had a great conversation. And um, it's just very nice to meet you. Yeah, you as well. So, <laughs> okay. All right. So um, we're going to end here. And my name is Denise Hurley. And this is uh, part of my Journeys um, series, uh, this special edition. And uh, we just spoke with uh, Meg Kilcoin. So, uh, Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Denise. You're Bye, welcome. everybody.